Oh, wow. What a crowd. <laughs> Love it. Mark, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for coming all the way from SF to Helsinki. It's been great, yeah. Uh, we've been given a rather wide topic to discuss today, which is how to build the next big thing and predict what is the next big thing. So since we only have 25 minutes, um, I would suggest that we focus more on the how to build the next big thing part and um, a bit less in the predicting what it is. How does that sound to you? That sounds good. Predictions, cool. they're too hard. And somebody always comes back and says, you totally blew that. Like, right. <laughs> so um, before we dive deeper into, into the topic, I, I'd like to ask something else, though. Um, during the last few days, me and you, we have been uh, visiting quite many teams here in, um, in, in, in Helsinki, both uh, domestic and, and teams from, from abroad. Uh, but I'm especially curious about the teams that you have met here in, in, in the Finnish teams. Um, what do you think of them? What's the state of the Finnish tech based on what you've seen so far? Yeah, so I had the opportunity of visiting VTT, as you, as you know, uh, before, before Slush. And that was amazing because, you know, it's everything from quantum computing to synthetic biology and all kinds of crazy stuff in between. That was super inspiring. I, I didn't know, frankly, I didn't know Finland was doing that kind of stuff. And this is, you know, ignorance from, from being in Silicon Valley where all things, you know, are supposed to be there. Uh, and then now that I've been at Slush, I'm just blown away by this whole operation. I mean, from, the, from every aspect of it. Uh, the teams that I've met here uh, are doing everything from, you know, vertical wind turbines that can survive in harsh, cold, frozen environments, which you know, seems like a great place to be testing it, is here, uh, to uh, carbon markets, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, recycling of, of, uh, of electronics in marketplaces. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, it, excellent, all really well done, well, well thought out. Uh, you know, I, I will say it, it's a little, but very Silicon Valley caliber, which uh, is super impressive. Happy to hear that. But folks out there, don't get too confident. Um, keep working hard. Um, look, I do have tons of questions to ask. Really, we could talk for hours. But I tried to pick the most, um, the, the, the most relevant and, and, and the, the best, best, best ones. So to kick off, when you look at those teams, both the ones that you have been meeting here and those that you have got to meet in, during the recent years, do you think that the founders of, and the scientists are really um, looking at the right things, looking at the right problems, and try even, or do they even look at, the, I mean, try to, to identify those, or are they just going after something and hope to end up in building something such as Tesla? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the, the, the purposes of an entrepreneur, or one of, one of its, the key focuses, is, is to, to figure out how to take a technology that exists. And sometimes the technology gets created first, and then you're looking for the problems that it has to solve. Um, and sometimes you're creating the technology to solve a specific problem. But it really is about the entrepreneur finding that right product market fit, finding exactly the thing that is solving the problem for the customer. And you know, they might, the customer may not really even perceive it as a big problem, but once they see it, they go, oh my gosh, this is making my life so much better. Uh, so we see a lot of, of companies, both you know, in tech, in, uh, certainly in Silicon Valley, where they have a really neat technology. They've come up with something you know, really clever technically, but they don't, they don't know what it's going to solve. And those are difficult. And that's the, the, the role of the entrepreneur is to figure out how to take that technology and make it into something that, that actually has meaning for people and has real value. Right. So it's no secret to anyone what a success Tesla has really been. Um, it's been two decades now since you guys um, went to found yeah. Tesla. Did you back, reflecting uh, to back then, did you really think that you are at a, a big problem right now, or was this like some sort of coincidence? Uh, well, we were pretty sure that we were going to have to electrify transportation. I mean, that's, that's a, the big problem. You know, it was really, really clear that, uh, that oil was not a good thing for the world. I had lived in Saudi Arabia for years. I had seen what the oil economy was doing there and how much wealth and power was being you know, transferred to the Middle East. 
and not necessarily stewarded well there. As well as obviously the carbon uh, thing, which in 2003 was much less clear. You know, the, the global warming. If you were a scientist, it was becoming clear. If you were, you know, kind of not in that community, it was much less clear. But we we were getting there in 2003. So decarbonizing uh, transportation, and, and and when you talk about transportation, it's really about cars because that's that's where most of it comes from. So we had to do something about that, and we realized that the technology was just just barely possible. You know, we, you know, our background, Martin and I, my co-founder, uh, have a background in consumer electronics, and we saw that, that batteries getting better every, every year, a little bit better. And when you do the equations, when you actually work out the math and you say, can you make a compelling car uh, that's electric with these batteries, because batteries are what limits it, that the batteries were just barely good enough in 2003. So it was perfect, because we knew that, oh, God, if we could do it now, by the time we get into production, it's going to be even better. And by the time we get big, it's going to be really great. Right. And we're just going to have better margins, better performance. It's just going to, everything is going to be better in the future if we can make it work now. Right. Let's dive, dive a bit deeper now in the, in the building part. Um, I think not many of us can really imagine the endless amount of trade-offs you guys have had to really uh, make in order to get the first car out there and, and you know, work. Um, can you describe a bit the, the path? How does the path look like to get from lab to fab and building something through the last and something great such as Tesla? Yeah, I mean, there are so many trade-offs along the way, particularly with something as complicated as a car. Uh, one thing that we did early on is we, we did have a North Star. It's, you know, uh, we were talking about this backstage a little bit. A North Star in, in, you know, in the U.S. is it's, you know, the star that you navigate by. So when a company has a North Star, they have you know, some statement which, which keeps, keeps everyone aligned. And so you know, Tesla's North Star would have been uh, building an electric car that delights the customer. And 20 years ago, there had never been an electric car that delighted anybody. You know, except maybe a golfer someplace. I mean, it was, you know, like a disaster. So to make one that delighted the customer, that was always our North Star. To do that, you know, we figured out all the pieces of that puzzle to do that. But um, each one of those technical, you know, challenges had trade-offs. You know, whether it was we had to make the car a certain width because our manufacturing partner their machines could only grab cars of a certain width. And we really wanted it to be wider, but we couldn't do that because their, their machines, their manufacturing machines couldn't grab it. All the way to uh, whether we had to redo the, 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 the chassis to make it easier to get in and out for, for customers. And, and that was, you know, it was a million dollar decision we made. That was a huge trade-off. Uh, it was a delay in, 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 in uh, production. It was a very expensive decision, but we didn't think we could delight the customer if they had to fall into the car, right? Yeah, this was not going to work. So we had to redesign part of it to make it easier to get in and out of. Because the original, you know, original Tesla was a small roadster. Mm. Uh, it was the best we could do at the time. Right. But so that, because the industry has been there for quite a long time already when you guys started to, to uh, work on it, uh, on, 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 on the first car. Um, how did you balance between, you know, qu quick and dirty and um, perfectionism? So uh, everything is a compromise, right? And the most important thing is getting a product out into the marketplace and getting that feedback back from the customer. Now, for something like a car, there are things you can't compromise on, safety being the obvious one, right? Safety, uh, we made certain compromises on performance in order to make it happen you know, in time. But you, know, the, the, you have to get the product out because you just don't know how your customers are going to use your product. And whether that's you know, on a website or, or a physical object, we were really, really pushing to get the production as quickly as we could because we wanted that feedback. We even, when we had prototypes, uh, because we didn't, you know, we only had, you know, 10 of them to drive, we s would send them on um, sleepaway program is what we called it. So any employee could check out one of the cars and take it home. But the deal is that they had to take it home and drive it around and park it in their garage and plug it in 
And, and then they could come back the next morning and they had to report on everything that didn't work the way they expected. And, and we ideally, we'd have different employees each time who had never gotten to really experience the car because we, we, didn't, and we wanted to have that sort of um, feedback you know, at a time before we could actually sell a car to somebody and ask. And by the time you sell it, it's kind of too late. So we were always tweaking things, trying to make it more perfect, if you will. But we weren't going to wait. We weren't going to like not ship cars once they were you know, safe and certified because we felt uh, the interior paint wasn't right or something. You know, we really, really had to get them out. And right. there was, of course, economic reasons for that as well. But you, you just got to have that customer feedback. Right. The time seems to be flying. Um, I try to be fast, faster with my questions. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make my answers shorter. No, don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to be jumping a bit from a thing to another. Please bear with me. Uh, but um, so moving forward to, uh, came to my mind this one interview with uh, Jeff Bezos, and he was describing the. Uh, the strategy which they m a strategy and their approach in, 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 in acquisitions and he was saying that how Amazon really looks into um, every time they, they purchase a company they look whether it is um, run by missionaries or mercenaries um, so my question really here is that which, what's which the, one does he like well good question I'm the mercenary sure. one or the, or, or the missionary, missionary according oh, okay, to him that's good. that's good but you can ask him as I guess <laughs> you know him better than I do oh, oh yeah um, but founders of, often operate with certain certain uh, assumptions and my question really here is that what's the balance between clear mission and some sort of bias coupled with optimism and curiosity well so you know, we, Sparrow, the venture firm that I'm with, um, we really focus on mission-driven founders. And it's a cliche, right? You know, mission-driven. But, but we really are looking for, for people who, who really believe in their product, whatever that product is. Uh, you know, they, they really like it. They, they want it to be out in the world. They want to have other people experience that because we think that that's really how you build strong, strong companies. Um, the mercenary thing doesn't really appeal to us, uh, appeal to us either. The, the importance of that mission is that you get to, uh, it really keeps the company culture around it. It allows you to recruit easier uh, because can, people like to come to a, a thing where they, they feel that they're contributing to something that has meaning. Uh, it makes the fundraising, I think, easier as well. The customers, it's a great brand play and the, and the customers you know, sense the mission. So you know, like we're really, really into mission. I'm not sure I answered your question, but but I don't, you, you're going to spend all of your time on a startup. Startups are really hard. You're going to be working and working and working at the startup to, to do a startup that you don't really care about it in some sense and you only want it to have a, you know, a high acquisition value. It, it just seems hard to believe that anyone would do that. Right. But you do, you do, do I guess, some sort of um, forecasting as a founder. I mean, you might under forecast it's up, or up and to the right. It's always up and to the right. You know, right, it's, of it's, course. How else? There. But should you, should you as a founder like, do some sort of, you know, like forecasting where the, uh, where the industry is going, where, you know, what are my chances and where we might be as a company and as a team in, in the near future? Yeah, so, you know, forecasting is, is extremely hard, particularly if it's a product that hasn't, you're not competing with other products that are kind of very similar, you know, so the, the, the market metrics are, are not, the metrics are not very visible. Um, you know, as a founder pitching, you want to make sure that the, the investors believe that there's a big market for it. Right. But it has to be realistic. And any decent investor will do their own forecasting as well. You know, they'll do a, a sort of a bottoms up thing of, you know, how big is this market? And if you say you're going to be selling $10 billion of the product and the grounds up thing says that, you know, the whole market's only a billion dollars, I mean, that is not, that is not, uh, providing trust <laughs> for you. Um, however, some founders are really conservative and they, they really want to keep their numbers really, really small so that they can you know, beat them potentially. Uh, and investors have to think that out as well because you don't know which is the founder making the numbers really, really high or is the founder you know, sort of sandbagging the numbers or doesn't think they can, they can get it. Uh, so we always do our own grounds up. As a, as a founder, what you want to do, in my opinion, is come up with something realistic as best you can. 
And you want to be looking at what the market is doing. Like we knew that batteries were going to get cheaper and better because they had over 50 years. You know, we had a lot of data to support that. Uh, and, and we had some idea of how many cars we could sell, you know, which we were basically production limited, it turned out, the whole time because the demand was, was, was good for that. But, we, you know, you, <laughs> forecasting is important. It's um, difficult. That whole yeah. the, figuring out the future thing, super hard. No, of course. But that's kind of like um, close to forecasting, but uh, let's move just a bit to risk-taking from for forecasting. When I look at those teams that I've been uh, uh, meeting with lately, and I mean those very early stage startups uh, and sci and, or just teams, like team of scientists and stuff, it seems to me that, and maybe this is a bit tough, but uh, it seems to me that um, perhaps the biggest risk they have taken is jumping into the cold water and become an entrepreneur. Um, mm -hmm. And what I basically have expected is that you would see that to be the first risk, but not the biggest one. Do you think this is the case that startup entrepreneurs already at the early stage stop taking big risks? And would you advise them to actually bet more on <laughs> things? Well, if they bet on things that win, they want to be doing that a lot. Yeah, right. that, that, that's the problem. <laughs> uh, you know, what you don't want to do, you know, you, you've taken the big risk of being an entrepreneur, and you're working on your mission, and you're working on your product and everything, and you want to get that out and get the feedback. Um, if you're taking a big risk on that, is that you know, you're coming out with a new product offering? Well, that could be really good. So what you don't want to do is sort of bet the company on, on a particular product where you don't have any feedback yet. And, and when you do take risk, or at least technical risks, in, in the case that I was most involved with, when we took technical risks, we kind of made sure that we had a backup plan. You know, we really want it to work out this way, but if we can't, well, we can still do it in molded, you know, carbon fiber or whatever. Or not molded carbon fiber. We can still hand lay the carbon fiber if we really, really needed to. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to do something, you know, different that was more efficient or you know cheaper or whatever, the, whatever or stronger, whatever the issue was. So. You know, there's always risks. Um, what I find interesting is how big companies that have unlimited resources and can, you know, absorb lots of losses almost never take any risk at all. And, and that's, that's the thing that allows entrepreneurs to take them on and, and crush them potentially. Right. I think we have to move forward with some um, other, other questions I have here in mind. Um, so I'm going to jump a bit uh, quite far from the topic we were discussing now okay. here. But I got to meet with uh, the chief advisor to, uh, uh, to the Na uh, NASA's boss uh, back in 2018. I remember him saying something very fascinating, and I just um, uh, picked up the, the, the quote here, pretty much a direct quote. And he said that back then that in order for people to come up with new things, they need to be able to do whatever they want, meaning innovate freely, because this is how people invent, and everyone is needed to complete the big picture. So what is we needed to build a great company such as Tesla, keeping this comment in mind? Yeah, well, NASA, it's funny that you picked NASA because they are historically, in the US, the, the NASA is the space agency, and they did a, um, a really great job in the 50s and 60s, and then they stopped taking any risk at all and allowed Elon, uh, you know, our investor, now CEO of Tesla, to ultimately completely disrupt the, the rocket industry, if you will, uh, because they didn't take any risks and they, they, were, they were way too, too conservative. Uh, so, and I do find it interesting that he says, oh, you want the engineers to just do whatever they want. Um, I don't know if you, you know, saw um, the, 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 the opening keynote by, uh, uh, I'm blanking on her name from Swipe. Uh, from, from no, I can't remember. No, I can't. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and and she was incredibly good at at making things happen, but I'm not sure that you could be very creative um, when you're doing that. You know, and and Claire, thank you. Um, and you want to have everything kind of on tight ropes when you're executing. Now, within the team, they're creating and being innovative, but you really want to keep 
keep things rolling along. You can't have them just doing random things. You know, it's, it's you, you got to have those goals and you got to have those objectives and keep everything in lockstep because you have this giant team. You have the puzzle's really complicated. You've got to get all the pieces of the puzzle to come together to make that product. You know, there's a, there's a saying in the in the car industry that or in manufacturing that you know it takes you know five thousand parts to to make the car, but only one part to not make the car. You know, like everything's got to come together to make that that final object. So you you got to be careful with being sort of too creative along the way because if anything slips, you know everything slips. Right. But you think that the future companies are going to be a bit more like, kind of like, NASA-minded companies? They still need to produce stuff on time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you. But you can do that and be quite creative. I think yeah. you know Tesla does that fairly well. SpaceX certainly does. Lots of companies do. Apple, you know, does it very, very well. Right. And do you have any practical um, example in mind? How would you advise? you know, um, founders to balance between freedom and mission? Well, freedom should always be in the in service of the mission. I mean, th having that North Star, having that mission that's very clearly articulated is great because it allows you to get rid of distractions that don't advance the mission. You know, at Tesla we got many opportunities to do things for other companies for millions and millions of dollars at a time when we didn't have much money. But we were able to always look at the mission and, and look at our North Star of, you know, does this advance getting a car on the market that's an electric car that delights the customer, is this directly helping us or not? And if it wasn't, we had to say no, which kept us, kept us very focused. Um, so, you know, but along the way, we're innovating on all kinds of different things, whether it's battery architecture or the, 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 the inverters that make the car go, for example. Uh, and we're redesigning those things because it's always in the, the, in the service of the mission, right? So you can be very creative that way, but it's always about, you know, how are we going to delight the customer? How are we going to make the car better? How are we going to get, you know, the thing to market and get that feedback? Right. Um, let's move from the how to be the ne next big thing to the predicting the next big thing part. Um, well, with time there seem to be, there always seem to be some sort of waves of wow tech. And as we all know, there seem to be a, a quite a relatively long AI summer in terms of, of, of hype. What do you think is um, AI here to stay? So, yeah, AI is here. I mean, I don't know what the next big thing really is, because if I could predict that really easily, you know, we would just put all of our money in that and, you know, we'd be done for the day. Um, AI has the feel of something that is like the Internet was and, and like, frankly, electricity was, you know, 100 years ago, that it is super interesting. People can imagine lots of uses for it. Um, and there's lots of hype around it. But nobody knows exactly what it's going to do. And like the internet before, you know, it ended up being in everything ultimately. But it itself, you know, was only the enabling of a, an entire ecosystem living on top of it. And I think that AI is that same thing in that, you know, 10 years from now, AI is going to be in everything. Um, but, you know, who, who gets the value for that? Where, where the money is, if you will, in AI, to me, is very unclear yet. Um, and so, it, we, you know, we'll see. I think it's, it's incredible, though. I mean, I think we're, we're really at the very beginning of, of AI. And again, like a lot of things, it's just going to, get, it's going to get better and better and better. And we're going to be able to use it for more and more things. And some of those things are going to be amazing, whether it's new materials or new, uh, new plants or, you know, food or whatever. Right. As we are running out of time, this is my, pretty much my very final question. Um, yeah, I agree. It's quite of unfair to um, ask anyone what's, re what's really the next big thing, as we can't just live only with one sector, right? Because we need, we need food industry, and we need the transportation, mm -hmm. and the healthcare, and energy, yeah. and yada, yada, yada. But um, if you were to found a company today, what would that be? What would it be? And why? Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think some of the most exciting stuff is in synth synthetic biology. Uh, you know, CRISPR and its ilk are making us uh, the ability to change life itself, which is like, you know, sounds very grand, but, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. 
So I would, I would do a synthetic biology company focused probably on new agricultural products that are focused on delighting the customer. So they'd be very nutritious, wonderfully tasting, um, and they happen to grow really well in a changing climate. Right. Well, thanks, Mark. I think you made uh, building Tesla look easy. So <laughs> thanks for inspiring everyone here, and thanks for coming all the way from SF once again. This was uh, fun and pleasure. Yeah, great fun. Thank you. Thank you.